morning. Good morning. So slideshow. All right, is everybody seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Okay, so wanna thank everyone on here for attending, being part of our Environmental Fridays series. Environmental Fridays, it is personal. Um, we are nearing the end, actually, you'll see that here pretty soon, but if you still want to get, take a look at our website, you could use the link below or you can use the QR code to the right. Um, for the rest of this uh, season, this is season six, um, we have, well, of course, today's presentation and you'll hear more about that uh, pretty soon. Then next week, Friday, we have a journalist, an environmental journalist, Andrew Revkin, speaking about how to communicate climate change and sustainability. Then uh, the following week on the 26th, the last Friday of uh, this month, <clears throat> uh, we will hear from Monica about the National Asthma and Allergy Month, because in May, May is the National Asthma and Allergy uh, Month. And so she will basically kind of kick it off here on Environmental Fridays. She is with the EPA, our region here in Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, and some others, of course, um, is our region five EPA. Then finally, on our very first uh, Friday in May, we will close off season six um, with a discussion, presentation about the chemical composition of the Canadian fires. We had a lot of that last summer. I don't know what's gonna happen this summer, but it would be of interest to find out what chemicals were in the wildfires. You'll see uh, Motria from the Centers for Disease Control will take us um, there. So this morning I have the privilege to have as my co-host, a dear friend, Stacy Noriega. And um, Stacy, hello Stacy. Are you there, Stacy? I am. I'm right okay. here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, what I want to do and put you on the spot in doing so, not really. Apart from teaching, which I know is one of your passions, um, tell me three things you love most about Trinidad and Tobago. Because I know that's one of your other passions. <laughs> Stacy? <laughs> yes, certainly. I love everything. <laughs> I love everything about my country. Are you guys hearing me? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Yes. yes. So one of the things I love, and, and um, Desmond knows that, I love the what should I say flora and fauna yeah. and we laugh because I'm always scared about stuff <laughs> but I love visiting places of interest I love taking people to see those places of interest That's right. um, Desmond often um, just about that if there's any place in Trinidad I have not been to and not just Trinidad but also Tobago mm -hmm. um, I've explored quite a bit and that's one of the things I love I also tell people that while other Caribbean islands boast mm -hmm. about their beaches about this we are uniquely situated in Trinidad where we have a little bit of this 
and a little bit of that. <laughs> so you can find the fun, you can find good beaches. Um, while we might not boast of have, being surrounded with all the best beaches, there are some fabulous ones. So in Trinidad, you can get a taste of everything as opposed to other places that really you will just go there for one thing. I am an advocate. If you want a taste of everything and you can't go anywhere else, come to Trinidad. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you crack me up so much. <laughs> I had to I had to put you on the spot, which is not really on the spot because you know it's natural. Yes. So you will hear more from my dear friend Stacy here when she introduces our main speaker. So at this point, we will hear from Darden, um, Daniel, Mr. Daniel. He is currently the chairman of the Tobago Reforestation and Watershed Program, Management Program. He's also director at the Tobago Agribusiness Development Company. And he's held many different positions uh, here. I'm not gonna read them all. Um, his background includes a bachelor of, uh, in business administration, an MBA. Um, he also studied music and theology. This dude likes to learn. <laughs> he's, he's a fan of knowledge. So with that, Darren, Mr. Daniel, could you tell us a little bit about um, Tobago reforestation? I will stop sharing and... Yeah, there you go. Okay, um, pleasant good morning to each and everyone. Um, I am Dean and Daniel. I'm the current chairman of the Tobago Reforestation and Watershed Rehabilitation Program. The T TRWRP or Tobago Reforestation for short is a special purpose state enterprise or a non-profit company that was set up in 2016 to manage the Tobago arm of the National Reforestation Program. Um, since our inception, we have been involved in reforestation work, being in the new areas across could, the island. Darren, could and, we see? Could we see you? Are you? Could we actually see you? See you? Okay, one second. Okay. We like to right. we like to make it personal. You know, it's Environmental Fridays. It is personal. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Yes, so. Um, since the inception of the, the reforestation program, we have been involved in doing works to um, reforest the nudit areas across the island, including mm -hmm. state lands and so on. We also involve in aspects of uh, watershed rehabilitation, which would include things like um, doing drainage work, uh, riparian streams, um, land management aspects, and so on. We have a broader mandate. Um, as recently, we have taken on the aspect of agroforestry, the great um, forest type, natural forest type with ag some aspects of agriculture, as well as social enterprise, wherein we help to um, effect economic transformation of people through programs which promote um, the creation of self-sustaining and profitable commercial enterprises coming out of the business. As a mission for the organization, we contributed the islands as Tobago self-sufficiency to forestry, watershed management, agroforestry, and social enterprise. And our how we envision ourselves is an organization that helps um, with the forest that feeds, heals, inspires, and transforms lives. And um, in terms of the, the main goals we have as an organization is really to help to sustain the forest capital of Tobago. As some of you all know, um, Tobago has the oldest forest reserve in the Western Hemisphere. It's currently 248 years old. Um, that forest reserve has been an invaluable asset to the island. It, it sustains a lot of livelihood. It maintains a, a, a superb ecosystem. And we are doing <clears throat> all the things that we, we need to do to help to maintain the early forest capital of Tobago. In addition to which, uh, we we embed the whole aspect of agroforestry to make our contribution to the whole goal for food security on the island. And as an organization, we, we involve in a 
aspect of social enterprise, which will include um, helping persons which we have that we treat with within the different communities to make them, while we develop the first capital, while we do the watershed rehabilitation work, that they benefit socioeconomically as well. So um, that in a nutshell is what the, um, the, the program is about. Uh, on a practical basis, we do various things in, across the, all of Tobago. Um, we currently have groups in three different areas in Tobago doing reforestation work. Um, we do also partner with international organizations to do various types of work. Um, currently, we are partnering with the UN Food and Agricultural Organization to do work on the, the white wing, saber wing, hummingbird, hummingbird here in Tobago. We are also have partnered with the United Nations Development Program, where we do work in the area of um, using indigenous herbs and so on to make teas. Um, it's, it's called the Tobago Bay Leaf and Herbal Spice Teas Project. Um, we recently won a grant from the United Nations Development Program, which will go towards funding that program. And what we intend to do is to work within various communities in a certain catchment area to grow these herbs, to grow these spices, and then we'll engage in commercial enterprises to turn these herbs and spices into teas, tea bags that could be sold within the um, supermarket value chain. So mm -hmm. that in a nutshell kind of encapsulate the type of work that we do. Um, to have fun, sometimes we, we engage in something called hike and plant, where we, we just we pull hundreds of persons from, the last time we did it in September last year, from Trinidad and uh, different persons within the community here in Tobago. And we, we planted 1,500 trees in less than three hours. So we build fun into actually reforestation work. So we're going to do it again this year, twice this time. And so, so we do all those nice little things to help to, to bring the sensitization of the need for reforestation, to be able to protect the environment, maintain the ecosystem and all these lovely things. Okay. So I have a question uh, to actually start off with. The reforestation is in part due to the still, the legacy of the hurricane that passed through Tobago. Is that right? That destroyed? Yes. Yeah. Yes, in, in 1963, um, we had a hurricane flora, which devastated a lot of the, the, the current main ridge forest reserve that we do have. And what we have emerging now is a secondary forest. Those species that have survived the onslaught are more or less re-emerging themselves. So we, we are protecting it. Um, it serves a, a, a great need. Um, it helps in the forestry. It provides a habitat for birds and bees and all the lovely pollinators, which will be the theme of what we'll be talking about later right. on today. Right. And um, so so we, we, we're doing our role to help to maintain that that forest capital um, as a result of that onslaught. So um, we're doing the forestation very smart so that if anything like a hurricane flora re-emerges, mm -hmm. that it doesn't um, create all the damage that it did back then. Okay. Anybody has comments or questions? I have more, but I want to make sure other people... Anyone, you could unmute and ask your questions or make a comment. Um, I love the pull and plant idea. I think that's great. Yes. I can plant. I can plant. I can plant, yes. Yes. Right. I was just wondering, um, if you, what is this um, climate smart trees that you're going to be planting? Yeah. What kind of, what kind of trees does, are these? Some with deep roots, or or kind of um, how are you going to prevent trees being devastated by a hurricane? This is why I'm I'm kind of interested. <laughs> okay. Well, um, we, we, the the experts so far um decided we're going to be planting a lot of the timber trees like the teak, sorry teak, mahogany, sap, maho, and and these type of trees, mm -hmm. and I'm um, trying to maintain as much as possible the different layers that you would find. I'm um, using permaculture principles so that um some of the trees will act as windbreaks for other plant species, mm -hmm. but um and plant them in a certain type of contour and, and be very selective of the root type so that you could help to maintain the soil. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah, so as you say, quite right. a lot of um, the timber timber type trees. Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I was just wondering, and all of them are grown from seed rather than from cuttings, right? Yes, a lot of them are grown from seeds. And what happens is that the, the forest rangers, they would um, go and collect seeds from time to time and then maintain a nursery that um, propagate these trees for replanting in the forest. Yeah, sometimes is it not, would it not make life easier just plant the seeds rather than plant the trees? Because the seeds will, will grow and um, if you have to, if you plant the trees themselves, then um, you have to water them and look after them quite often. Whereas if you plant the seeds and they grow of their own, then it, um, it they're stronger, sure, put it yeah. that way. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just agree, a thought. Yeah, yeah just a thought. Yeah. On hillsides, we found it easier to plant the seeds and then use the seed, the, the canopy from the seeds to plant underneath. Mm, okay. Okay. But it sounds as if by doing it in layers, this makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So another thing I was uh, that caught my attention is the local herbs and spices and stuff. How how um recent or how long has this initiative been going on? Well, um, it's only last year we um we applied to the United Nations Small Grants Program and was granted um the oh. grant to kickstart the program. So mm -hmm. what what we are doing now in the preparatory stage is actually sourcing the plant material. It mm -hmm. would include bay leaf, fever grafts, um, uh, vanilla, and this this type of um, plants. Mm -hmm. And we also outline working with community groups within a certain catchment area to have the land cleared so that we're going to be putting down these um, trees and plants and shrubs in those areas so that um, when so that they will have stewardship of the plants. Mm -hmm. And when they come time for um, harvesting, we'll take it to a, a solar drying facility where we're going to be teaching the women within the community how to operate solar drying units to make the teas, which will be packaged by taco and sell within the supermarket value chain. Yeah, that so I'm assuming, I might be wrong, that this might be the first sort of like systematic organized attempt to do this in that area of our local herbs and spices and stuff? Yes, yes, this will be the first attempt at doing that. Okay, very good, very good. All right, um, we could probably take one more comment yeah. or question and then we'll move on. Just um, a quick, no, sorry, you carry on, uh, thank you, pardon. I, I have my standard four class um, mm -hmm. logged in and um, I would like Mr. Daniel to give them some little tips as to what they can do uh, as children to show that they have been sensitized to stuff like this, you know, because I think sometimes it's only when they get to secondary school mm -hmm. that we push that kind of thing. And by this time, they have already established their mindsets. Mm -hmm. So what can they do, even though they might be little? Um, <laughs> and for those who are wondering, um, standard four is equivalent to fifth grade. Okay, okay. Yeah. So what, what, what I would advise these students to, to, to do, first and foremost, is to be aware of the environment that is um, around them. Mm -hmm. When they are home, put down the gadgets and just go outside. <laughs> yes. Look around. Amen. Look at, the trees, <laughs> look at the birds, look at the butterfly, yeah. look yeah. at the soil, dig it up, smell it, look at the grass, yeah. the shoe, and your 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 whole senses because one of the things I find, especially with the education system, is lack of sensory stimulation. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Um th these senses aren't awakened except on a gadget. But we mean just go outside and observe the trees. Look how how they grow naturally in, in layers. You will notice these things. Look and see what um habitat is the trees are being created for, and a whole world will be open up to you. And you, yep. that, that is a way how you're going to be sensitized of what's happening around you. And then you get to recognize as students, young ones, mm. the importance of trees, the importance particularly of pollinators. Mm. 
mm -hmm. because you see pollinators will include insects maybe ants you're gonna be bees butterflies flies all these things they play a crucial crucial role in making sure that we get food to eat that the trees are um, are reproduced and we, we, we they fertilize or pollinate the different trees so that we we are able to to continue to live so the the main thing I would advise for you students to start is just to become aware of the environment around you. Ask your parents to take you to the beaches and the rivers and the streams and so on instead of the malls and you a whole world will be open up to you. I love it. I love it. That was a great question and a great answer. Stacy, you probably need to give them an assignment now. Go out. I don't know what you you teach, but go out and oh yeah, and I love that response. Write. I love that response. <laughs> yes, and then have them write about it or something. Anyway, that that was good. That was really good. All right. So next we are going to move on, and <laughs> Stacy, you could go ahead and introduce. Um, you could unmute, uh, show your yes, come up. Stacey. Yeah. Can I come up? Come on now. Ah, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. He's asking if he could come off the camera. Yes. Yes. All right. So you could introduce our speaker, main speaker. Okay. And let me officially say good morning to mm -hmm. everyone. And I am very thankful that my good friend, Dr. Desmond Mori has asked me to do this today. And I'm also very, very grateful that my students get an opportunity um, to experience this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll have some um, budding scientists in that class. I have some who I think will be very interested. Um, I am also honored to introduce our guest speaker for today. And um, she's very gracious and I know she won't um, hold this against me, but I'll do my best at it. Her name is Lena Depperwolf, Dem Demperwolf, <laughs> and I am so happy to be introducing her because we come from the same part of the world, this beautiful sunny part of the world. And so she currently serves as a bi biodiversity specialist at the Environmental Policy and Planning Division of the Ministry of Planning and Development of Trinidad and Tobago. She is a pollination ecologist and ecosystem services specialist whose past research focus on the identification, assessment, and valuation of pollination services in neotropical agricultural landscapes. And I would really like her. Uh, she froze, she froze, she froze. Okay, hopefully she'll come back here quickly. Dr. Murray, we've been having internet problems throughout the island recently, so I don't okay. know. Okay. Yes, I'm here. She's back. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so in spite of all the good things we know about Trinidad, uh, you know, we are not perfect. <laughs> so, um, I do. I was, I was just about to say that I'm hoping that these terms will be explained by our guest speaker, so that my students will understand a little bit more as to what she does. But if I have to put this in a nutshell, I'm going to say that she does the groundwork for what we see on our tables when we go to eat. Hmm. And that pollination part of it, um, which I think a lot of us overlook, boys and girls I'm speaking to as well, hmm. you know, how does that happen? We take it for granted. And so we are very grateful for the work that she has been doing and, and the work that she has been doing, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but in the region and partnering with the University of um, the West Indies, as well as companies such as the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago. So um, without further ado, I know she will do a much better job as, at explaining what she does. 
but we are thrilled to have you today and I especially am very very interested in what you'll have to say to us so Miss Lena Demperwolf all right hi hi good morning everyone how's my audio are you guys okay we hear you really well okay perfect um, all right let yes. me let me go ahead and share my screen as is customary here we go all right so yes um so i know that's a lot of big words and um i know for kids especially so ecosystem services pollination that sort of thing so we're going to go through it bit by bit um so and i actually have some screen, ideas. full screen sorry do full screen so we oh, can sorry, sorry, my, yeah. my, it's okay not quite yeah there we go Yep, oh, there we go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Everybody good? All right. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> let's go. Um, we're going to talk about pollinators of the Caribbean, pollinators and pollination in general. And um, hopefully, I also have some exercises for kids to do. So we will see. So first of all, we're just going to have a, a discussion about basics of pollination. Who does that? Why do they do it? And how is it done? Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about Caribbean pollinators specifically and um, how to improve sort of the management and the conservation of pollinators and why we should even do that and how does it benefit you. So those are our key things. So I usually like to do a little bit of a warm up exercise with people. Actually, since this is fairly interactive, you guys can interrupt me and tell me um, what you think. So my, my first question is, well, we're going to talk about what is pollination? And after that, I will ask you a few questions. So pollination is just the transfer of the pollen grains that come from the male part of the flower, which is the anther, to the female part of the flower, which is the stigma. If that happens on the same plant, it's called self-pollination. If it happens on the plants of the same species, but different individuals, it's called cross-pollination. So that is the very basics. That's a diagram of a flower that I'm sure many of the adults have are familiar with from, from their days in school. Pollination is different from fertilization. Fertilization is when the pollen grain lands and then develops eventually into a seed and fruit. So fertilization is that component. Pollination is just moving the pollen grains from the male part to the female part. What happens after? is fertilization. So this is where the pollen grain will land. And that part down there is where a pollen tube will grow. And then the ovule and ovary will be fertilized and that will produce a seed and a fruit. So those are the very basics of, of how any kind of, of pollination happens. Now, my question to you is, do you think that only insects are pollinators? No. You don't have to say anything out loud, or you can say it out loud. You can just say it in your head if you think about it. No. Okay. So I'm hearing a no. So, right. Not only insects are pollinators. That's correct. So, this is my little warm up. What animals do you think contribute to pollination then? Bats. Bats. Very insects. good. Insects. Insects. We already, yes. <laughs> what else? So, you might actually be surprised to learn that Mammals. there's a lot more pollinators. We have birds, so hummingbirds, for instance, um, some of the others like banana quits, they also do some kind of pollination. There are bats, uh, monkeys in some cases can pollinate, um, various types of marsupials in other island, other countries, lemurs, bears, rabbits, deer, rodents, and then the usual suspects of bees, wasps, flies, ants, butterflies, and moths, and many other species. So there are actually far more recorded types of pollinators um, than one conventionally thinks of. So even lizards are known to pollinate some plants. And it's also important to know that not only honeybees contribute to pollination. So when people think of pollinators, they usually think of bees, and when they think of bees, they think of honeybees. But those are actually, um, in this part of the world, some of the least important pollinators. Um, they're very abundant, but the wild pollinators and the native ones are far more important because they co-evolved along our native species. So they developed at the same time and they fit better into the flowers to carry the pollen um, in a better way. So do you think all bees are yellow and black? No, no. <laughs> nope, okay, good. 
So here's an example of some of the bees found in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so you can see a little bit of the range of color. Uh, many people will look at a at an insect and they may not necessarily think that it's a bee just because of how it's colored. So there's a range of colors from black to brown to green to blue um, and that sort of thing. So many, many times people would say, oh, those are little flies, but they're actually small native bees um, that are buzzing around the flower. So those are just some of the ones that we that we tend to find here. Are all bees social? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so let me tell you what social means. Social means that they live together in a hive, that they have organized social structure. So there's a queen, there are workers, um, they all have different roles and they work together as a hive. In many cases, they may produce honey um, and that sort of thing. So that is what social means. Uh, the opposite of social in this context is solitary. So they don't produce honey, they don't live in a hive. They Most bees actually, burrow into the ground and live underground. So more than 70% of bees that you would see around actually live in burrows underground and make their, their nests there. Some are slightly social in the sense that they share uh, maybe a common entrance hole or something like that, but they don't share food resources. They don't have division of labor and that sort of thing. So the vast majority of bees are solitary and most of them are ground nesting, which is why it's so important to be careful when you till your soil. Hmm. Do all bees stink? Mm. No. No. Oh. I feel you guys are just saying that because I put the question here. So um, <laughs> no, they do not. And that is actually a very important point because so, so bees have a bit of a bad reputation, especially the whole killer bee thing and whatnot. Now, the bees that sting and that protect their hives are the social ones. And there are very few species. And there's only one species in Trinidad, which is the honeybee that we have, that will aggressively do so. Um, first and foremost, male bees cannot sting. It is only female bees that can sting. So male bees are out entirely. And many other species, they don't sting even if they could. Um, so you really have to accidentally step on one, squish it, or something like that. For, defend, for it to defend itself, for you to get that sort of response and reaction. So bees generally do not sting. They do not like to sting. Um, and um, there are also many stingless bees species um, that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that are social, but they don't and can't sting. So um, I just want to highlight a little bit how difficult it is to identify some of these. So I have a little thing here that says bee fly or wasp. Um, you can take a little... 10 seconds and take a look over these pictures and then you had a sign whether you think each one of these is a bee, a fly or a wasp. So I'm going to start on the top left hand corner. Um, any guess as to what that might be? A, a wasp. Okay, right. we have one wasp. Anybody else? All right, that is correct. That is a wasp. The one in the middle on top? B. Oh, that's a fly. Oh, <laughs> so, as you can tell a little bit by they have shorter antennae, their eyes take up most of their heads and they have a much less pronounced waist. And it's also about how they hold their wings. You see how they hold their wings spread out like that? They only mm -hmm. have one wing pair versus the, the bees and the um, wasps, which have two. So they hold them slightly differently. So they're held apart from the body. So that's part of part of that. The top right hand corner, any guesses? B. 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 That's correct. Uh, middle left. It's getting a little more difficult. Yeah, it's more difficult. But it holds its wings apart, so that's a fly. A bee? Yeah, yeah, oh, it's a job. fly. <laughs> Long yeah. oh. What about the middle? Hmm. <laughs> it's, fly. It's not a fly. Wasp. All right, that's, right. that's a wasp. Good that's, job. Yeah. And the middle right? That might be one people might be able to get more easily. A wasp? Wasp. Yes. What makes you say a wasp? It's probably because it has a very defined pedestal. So the middle piece is very, very narrow. And that's Skitty. very sort of indicative of a wasp. So bottom left? Bye. 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 One is a bee. A bee. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And the middle and the bottom? We're almost through, I promise. Uh, a wasp. Wasp. 
This is also a B. B. Oh, B. my God. And at the bottom right, what do you think? B. B. That one is a fly. Look at the head. How close fly. the eyes are. Yeah. yeah. So it's not very easy, right? Um. All right. Let's go on. So we'll talk about some pollination basics. Um. Generally, pollination food production. Um. I'm giving you some facts about it. So more than ninety percent of the two hundred fifty thousand species of modern flowering plants, and sixty five percent of all plant species are pollinated by animals. Hmm. Um. We're going through what people have been referring to as a global pollination crisis. And it is um, that a large number of species are disappearing, species are disappearing that we don't know about. Um, and as a result of that, we have crop losses, we have biodiversity losses and so on. And this is happening at a sort of an unprecedented rate. It's also that maybe over the last 20 years or so is really when we started monitoring pollinators on a global scale. Um, so that we're now starting to get this data as well. A large proportion of crop value is due to pollination, but it's unrecognized. So it's not incorporated into national planning. In many cases, um, I think they've made a lot of strides sort of in, in Europe in particular in terms of that area, but um, we really need to work on that over here. Hand pollination, which is humans going around with a paintbrush and taking pollen from one flower and putting it on the other, um, happens and it's so much so that in parts of China, um, there are lots of people employed doing hand pollination because they just don't have the pollinators anymore. Wow. But it's not nearly as effective as animal pollination. When animals do it, you get better quality fruit and you get more fruit. Um, there's a generally a global shift to animal pollinator crops. That means that we are now growing more things that require animals for pollination. There are two types of, or well, three types of pollination, really. One is by animal, one is by wind, and one is by water. Um, water is the least common, but the wind-pollinated plants are like um, corn and, um, well, it depends on what you call corn and what you call maize in different countries. But um, it's a lot of the, the, that gives you sort of carbohydrates and staples like that. But we are now growing more and more different crops that require animal pollinators, which can not only lead to a nutrition shortage, a food shortage, but a nutrition shortage as well. So for example, many of the crops that are producing vitamin A are produced by animal, uh, pollinated, sorry, by animals. And if you are not having that anymore, then that means that we have less um, food that contains vitamin A. And this is particularly a problem in countries that are already experiencing food insecurity. Um, animal pollination increases yield and quality of fruit, and there are generally a large number of threats, specifically from the agricultural sector, which is ironically the same area that needs those pollinators. But the pesticide use in particular, and um, some of the management practices, like we spoke about bees living in the ground, or a lot of bees living in the ground, for example, tilling your soil will kill them. So those are some of the things that we need to watch out for. Now, um, this is just a quick idea of to show you what might happen. So we have statistics for this on an international scale. This is from, this is what I've done a long time ago, here in Trinidad. So if all pollinators disappear, 88% of the hot peppers won't develop, close to 97% of the cucumbers won't develop, and more than 86% of okra won't develop. Mm. So that is if pollinators entirely disappear for those three crops. And we definitely need more data to that. And they're actually very simple experiments that you could do in a school. So if you have any interest in that, you can give me a shout at a later time and I will tell you what you could do with your students. It's very easy. Um, why are pollinators important? So pollination food production, obviously, they also provide other ecosystem services. Now, an ecosystem service is something that's um, a process in nature that humans benefit from. Um, there are different types of ecosystem services, but things like pollination, we benefit from the outputs of pollination or food production, we benefit from that, or water cycling, for instance. Those are all things that we benefit from. So uh, ecosystem services is something that is provided by nature that humans benefit from. Mm -hmm. And pollination maintains that. Um, also, you get things like honey, wax, pollen, propolis, royal jelly, that sort of thing from some of the other pollinators, like, um, like bees in particular and the social ones. So it's important to note that not all bees pollinate all flowers or not all pollinators, I should say, pollinate all flowers and not all flower visitors are pollinators. The intention of the flower is to be pollinated. The intention of the animal is to get food. 
So sometimes they do that by any means necessary. So this is why it's so difficult sometimes to prove that something is a pollinator. Because sometimes they dig holes at the base of the flower and pull out the nectar and the pollen. Sometimes they destroy the entire flower. Um, so there are different ways of doing that. So there are a few things that have to happen for pollination to be successful. So for instance, um, sufficient pollen must be transferred. So you have to have enough of it that has to go from one flower to the next. And this means, and it has to happen during time where the pollen is still viable and good, which is usually only for a few hours a day. And which is the, and the female part of it can actually receive the pollen. So it implies that the pollinator carries a large number of pollen grains to begin with, because the more pollen grains you have, the better the chance. It also means that the pollen has to be deposited and collected while it is viable. So that's usually during a very small period of time, and which is why climate change, for instance, is an issue, because it could change the time of day that pollinators go out to collect, or it could change the time of day that the pollen um, is viable, or the amount of time that it lasts for. Mm. Pollen is not modified for or during transport. So what you're seeing on top there is a honeybee, and it has this, this blob of um, pollen on the leg, um, in the pollen basket, and that uh, is there because the bee has chewed it and has stuck it on the leg. Um, and if you do that, it can no longer be used for pollination. It's just for food. So that pollen there is not useful for pollination. It also means that pollinators visit flowers of the same species in sequence. So they can't go from tomato to cucumber to okra to whatever. It has to be cucumber, 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 cucumber. And it becomes more complicated when male and female flowers are separate and not in the same flower. Um, they also possess physiological features that allow them to transport pollen grains. So they have hairy legs. They have wings that can carry them a distance. The flight distance and range matters. Um, the shape of the bee versus the size of the flower. If you have a very large flower, you would need a large animal to go in there. If you have a small flower, it has to be a small animal, that sort of thing. So they have to match. It's sort of a lock and key situation. And pollinators are capable of traveling the distance required in between. That's a very important one. Because if your plants that require pollination are 10 kilometers apart, but your bee or your butterfly or your hummingbird or whatever can only fly 500 meters, then you're not going to get that done. Generally, if you have a high diversity of pollinators, you have a high biodiversity in general. Biodiversity just means the collection of plants and animals on the planet and all of these things that are associated with it. So the more pollinators you have to facilitate this, the higher the rest of it usually is. Because the plants that they pollinate provide food for other animals, those animals provide food for other animals and so on. So pollinator diversity and biodiversity is extremely important to the health of an ecosystem in general. So to talk a little bit about Caribbean pollinators, um, and I profusely apologize for the vast number of bee photos. It's just that they're the easiest to photograph. Mm -hmm. um, butterflies and hummingbirds are not nearly as forgiving, um, which is why I borrowed a picture that Rachel Leung took for the hummingbirds. So the best documented pollinators that we have in the Caribbean are usually butterflies, hummingbirds, and bats. Um, so as you can see, the trend here is something large and fancy. Uh, they're easy to see, they're easy to capture, they're easy to take, to, to you know, to come across. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge about butterflies, there's a lot of knowledge about hummingbirds. There's generally a knowledge about the bat species, um, although the relationship with certain plants is not, is not really that well established. But these are the guys that we know the most about. The least known are the flies, as you can already tell. Um, so I share this picture here specifically because flies, especially surface flies, are extremely important ecologically and for you personally as well. These guys may not be the, the cutest and prettiest animals. However, um, they're excellent pollinators, especially the surface flies. They're also called flower flies. You can look them up. Um, and at different stages of their lives, they have different roles. So as... Um, in their earlier life stages, um, what you see in the bottom left there, that's called a rat-tailed maggot. That is the early life stages. It sounds pretty gross. Um, they look like extremely large mosquito larvae, but they're not. They feed on the mosquito larvae, and they are very good pest control agents in your garden and so on. So if you see these, best thing to do is leave them right there because they will take care of your pests for you. 
Wasps are also extremely good at pest control. So if you have wasps around and um, and spirit flies, they will help you immensely about controlling any kind of pest that you have. Um, and as adults, they are excellent pollinators. Uh, but the problem is that we don't know. So we have a started, well, I'm at the Ministry of Planning and Development, and one of the projects that we are running is with in conjunction with the Global Bioscan program, where we are putting up certain traps to catch insects, to catch flying insects, which are then shipped to Canada to be identified and DNA barcoded. So we're using their genetic identification or gen genetic material to identify them so that we know more about the species that we have here. Um, that has been going on for about a year now, and it will continue for another year or two. Um, so we are soon to receive some additional data on that. But the flies really do need do need the help because we also don't have many experts that work in that field. Um, this is just to show you that not everything pollinates everything. So this is also from something I've done a long time ago. Um, and this is just matching uh, certain pollinators to certain types of crops. Uh, we've looked at what kind of pollen grains they carry and um, what, they, what they tend to visit. So this is sort of, um, for example, within the bees, um, the honeybees, which is the Apis mellifera on top, uh, goes to a lot of different flowers and some others, um, like some of the butterflies down below, we've only found in one or two plants. So all of this to say that there are species that are generalists, which feed on almost everything and visit almost everything. And then there are those that are specialists and they have a very specific relationship with one type or only a few types of plants. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that we need to protect a little bit more because if they disappear, then the plants will disappear alongside it. Mm -hmm. Other recent work that we've done in Trinidad and Tobago um, under the Best NTT project, we've done um, in conjunction with Jeff SGP and the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club. A bee survey around northeast Trinidad, so around the Matura protected area and around the Tobago Main Ridge Forest Reserve. Um, we got some very interesting results from that, and I'm currently um running around begging for more funding to continue some of this. We have done under this also a bat survey that looked at um, species diversity of bats between a disturbed forest and an undisturbed forest. Uh, we have spent some time looking at seagrass pollinators. And um, we are working on establishing a plant pollinator catalog. So this is pulling from all of the information that is available within the Caribbean, within Trinidad and Tobago, some of it outside, um, to see what might be pollinating what as a starting point, because data is very scattered. And if we get it all into one place, then we can identify the gaps and say, OK, we need to know what pollinates this species, or we need to know what feeds this type of pollinator. And um, from we go from there. Uh, about butterfly catalog, uh, we're sort of in the process of updating the uh, the Barkans, um book and information in conjunction with Angus Tura. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a very big citizen science component. So I'll talk about iNaturalist a little bit later. And we also talked about, uh, talking a lot about improving stingless bee beekeeping. Um, that's also something you'll hear about in a minute. All right. Um, so from the bee survey, the highlights and what you see on the right is one of the uh, one, a new genus that we have we found. We surveyed areas surrounding Matura and the Main Ridge Forest Reserve, and so far we have within that recorded two new genera. So one of them is the Monoica on the right hand side there, and um, there are likely several species that are to be described. So we have about ten bees or so that don't fit any of the descriptions, and that uh, Dr. Lawrence Parker is very busy trying to. Uh, get identifications for and sending around to various other um, experts in that area. So the, the ones that are giving us trouble are the orchid bees. Um, I don't know if you've seen those around. Those are very large and green and have very big back legs. Um, and they sort of hover like flies and people always mistake them for flies. Seratina, which are tiny carpenter bees, and Lestra milita, which is a type of stingless bee. Um, Lawrence was also very good to develop a key for identifying female bees for us, which also didn't exist prior to this. And in general, we found about 70 species of 33 genera and um, of approximately 161 species that are now being recorded for Trinidad and Tobago. So we found just under half within a very tiny area of the country. So I am trying my best to get some more funding so that we can 
expand that survey because I am sure that we do not even have a tenth of the species reported here that, that we should know. All right, so if we're talking about stingless bees, um, they're called Meliponini, that's the tribe that they belong to. So stingless bees produce honey, they're social, and by definition, they don't sting, which is a great advantage. Their honey is of high medicinal value. Some of it is used for eye drops and wound healing and that sort of thing, can also be eaten in many cases. And it is um, it is highly sought after. It has been a sort of a practice in Trinidad and Tobago to keep stingless bees sort of as a cultural thing, but that has been declining over the last um, 20, 30, 40 years. And we are trying to support this a little bit more to bring stingless beekeepers together and um, discuss how they're doing things, how they're keeping these bees to be able to keep them keep them going and keep them alive. So on a global scale, this is where the stingless bees live, um, which is the neotropics. Um, so everything blue is where you would find stingless bees. So they're particularly found in this region as well. And within the Caribbean, this is sort of where we are. So the bottom right hand from, from Trinidad all the way up. Um, and you will see that there's some in Cuba and Jamaica and the Dominican Republic. And then there's a very small group there, um, Montserrat, Guadalupe, and Dominica, that also has some of these stingless bees. And the species that we've recorded, so in Trinidad and Tobago, we have the largest diversity, uh, presumably because of our close proximity to South America. Um, and then you have some species across the Caribbean as well. So if um, if there's anybody that's interested in stingless beekeeping, uh, you can also shoot me a message and I will um, put you onto all the resources that we've done. We've done lots of workshops on stingless beekeeping and practices and whatnot. And all of them are recorded and available on YouTube as well. So we have some resources available now that could be useful in that area. Something else I want to talk about is aquatic pollinators. So we don't really think of aquatic plants are something that needs pollinators. And for a long time, it was thought that it's just the water currents that carry the pollen around. But there's been some work done in Mexico where they showed that um, you actually see small crabs and crustacea, other crustaceans uh, and other small animals going between flowers and carrying pollen. So we have spent some time on that as well. And um, if you're in, again, if you're interested, let me know. I'll put you on to what we got. Um, so there's just generally been evidence that crustaceans contribute to pollination of seagrasses. And the seagrasses themselves then provide many of these ecosystem services that we talked about. So the seagrasses are feeding grounds for a bunch of other species like turtles, they're nursery grounds, and they help reduce the um, severity of waves and coastal erosion and so on. And this all rests, again, on pollinators being there and providing that services, that service so that these seagrasses and the seagrass beds are maintained. So the main issues that we're facing is just lack of organized data. So one of the way of the organization that we're trying to um, address that was by putting together a plant pollinator catalog to figure out what we actually have. But any data that there is in terms of anecdotal evidence or, or papers, so a lot of it is um, very scattered. So it's pulling it together and seeing where we're actually missing information. I think that within the English speaking Caribbean for Trinidad and Tobago, we now have um, a better idea of what we have uh, than for the other islands. So there's a lot of room for getting more information. Um, we're lacking supporting policies and guidelines, but that's not surprising because if we don't have a data, if we don't have the data and we don't know what we have, we can't really write anything to protect it. And also the issues with increasing threats uh, such as pesticide use, um, land degradation, and so on. And we have limited landmass. So we only have this amount of space in the Caribbean islands. We cannot go anywhere else and they cannot go anywhere else. And that is a major issue with small island developing states like what we all are in the Caribbean. Information we need about pollinators to make better decisions. We need to know who pollinates what. So on the right, you see some of the bees that report in the bee survey again. Um, we also need to know what they need. What do they, what do they eat? Where do they nest? Um, what kind of habitat requirements do they have? What kind of plants do they require? Um, what are some of the species specific threats? So one butterfly might respond differently to a certain type of pesticide than a hummingbird, for instance. So what are the issues for each particular species that we need? Um, and also population sizes and changes. Those are the things that are coming over time. Um, th that are some of the more higher end um, issues that we're, that we're looking at, because those are things that we can then answer once we have um, the other information. 
and red listing for, via the IUC, via IUCN. That can be done by any scientist or any group. Um, if you're interested in trying to figure out how to add species to the red list, um, there's a host of information on the IUCN website. But that will be also go a long way because it will also be able to inform policy at that point. Sorry, right, here we go. Um, which brings us to the policy bit. There's no pollinator or pollination policy, as far as I'm aware, within the, the Caribbean or the English-speaking Caribbean. In Trinidad and Tobago, under the project, again, we developed a draft theory of change, but that, was, that is as far as we've reached at this point. We're looking to take that forward. Um, pollination is mentioned in very few national documents, and there's generally lack of the data, as we've already discussed. Um, and just generally, is, pollination is not included in climate change or any kind of other policies. And that's that's a problem. So we're not really able to protect them properly. Um, sorry, just one second. Right. right. One last thing we're going to talk about is pollinator and pollination management. So, how do we better protect these guys, not knowing what we don't know? Um, threats to pollinators include things like pesticides and herbicides, and I think that is actually the biggest issue. Uh, even though there are standards set on each country about what they are importing and what they are allowing to come in and regulations for use, it does not really refer to pollinators. It is about human health and consumption and so on, if that exists in that way. Um, very likely, pollinators respond to pesticides the same way as the pest organisms that you're trying to get rid of. So if you're killing the pests, you're killing the pollinators. Um, there are no regulations that are specific to the pollinators. That's a big issue. And there are a large number of species. And every single species re might respond differently. So that is a big management issue because one could respond one way, another could respond another way. It is difficult to protect when species are not recorded. So once again, we don't know what we have and we don't know how they respond and we need the baseline information. If we're talking about habitat destruction or fragmentation, that's another big issue. Quarrying, logging, housing developments, all those things are issues. For the stingless bees, for example, um, honeybees can swarm. So if a tree is cut down and there's a honeybee hive in there, they will go somewhere else. That's not a problem. Stingless bees, for instance, cannot do that. They're excellent pollinators um, for native plants, but they can't move because their queens are too big to fly. So once they're established somewhere, they don't go anywhere. And if it is that they are um, their habitat is compromised and that they're damaged, then they cannot leave the, the hive dies, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also lack of legal protection, policies, management plans. We don't have the knowledge, data, awareness for farmers and the general public. And honeybees themselves may actually have a negative impact because they tend to bully native pollinators away from the plants. And because of their share numbers, they tend to take up a lot of the floral resources, which is the main limiting factor. And climate change is always, 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 always an issue. <laughs> All right. Oops, my bad. Okay. Land use intensification, so there are less diverse habitats and feeding grounds in and around agricultural plots. So if we have very intensive farming practices and we plant the same thing throughout, so I think our a bit of our I think that saves us a little bit is that most farmers in Trinidad, it's a sort of a small scale agriculture um, practices and they they intercrop, so they have different types of crops going at the same time, and that's generally a very good habit. Um, what has been a problem, I think, in North America, in Europe, and Australia, and so on, is a very large scale um, planting the same thing and very intensively farming the land. Increased use of pesticides, we have a, a serious issue. I think I've seen a statistic from the FAO that Trinidad and Tobago ranks within the top 10 globally of the highest pesticide use per land area. So there's a very severe issue there that needs to be addressed, um, not just for pollinators, but also for, for human health and otherwise. Uh, invasive alien species, so anybody that comes in that is not already here can outcompete the native species and they can transmit parasites and diseases. And diseases are also a major issue. So the diseases get passed at the flower. One, one in animal lands there and drops it off, the next one picks it up, everybody gets sick. And that's something that's also not, not very well recorded and, um, and established. So for agriculture, the things we can do is we can, first of all, reduce or eliminate pesticides. It's completely understandable if you cannot eliminate because it's difficult, uh, but you can use alternative methods of pest control, or you can reduce 
what you're using. You can spray at very specific time of day, for instance. So it's generally recommended that you use pesticides only in the evening when the pollinators are not out because they're mostly out during the morning period and that you do it in low wind conditions so it doesn't drift off to other areas. You can also use alternative pest control methods. So for instance, you can plant things like mint and basil and fragrant things in between that keep the pests away. Or um, you can use things like neem-based um, neem based pesticides. So there are a bunch of different options that can be explored. Intercropping, using different types of crops at the same time, rotating your crops frequently so that you don't have any specific type of pest establishing itself. And um, maintaining trees and wildflowers. It is incredibly helpful to have just the um, buffer of these wildflowers around. So what people would refer to as the weeds, just leave them be on the sides. They provide so much food for the pollinators. And that means they stick around to pollinate your plants when yours are flowering. You can reduce or eliminate tillage. Tilling the land is very bad for um, ground nesting pollinators. And you can also keep a portion of the land unplanted as a sort of a pollinator reserve. You can keep the stingless bees. You can The best thing also to do is leave old logs and, and fallen leaves and fallen trees and so on lying around because that's often used as material for nesting. And reduce cutting or trimming of other vegetation. Um, I've seen a study where somebody that was published and it was all over the place. And I was like, well, I can't believe, you know, <laughs> nobody's done this before. All they did was compare the number of times somebody cuts their lawn and the, the diversity of pollinators that came from it. And basically what, what the, the result was that if you cut your lawn less frequently, you have a much higher pollinator diversity, which makes complete sense, but that's, that's exactly it. If you switch from doing it every week to every other week, you're already helping the situation. Hmm. Pollinators at your home, what can you do? You can talk to your gardener about pesticides. That's a very big thing. I think most people are not aware, you know, they have people coming to take care of their lawn, but they may not be aware of what people are doing when they're out there. Ask them if they're using anything, what they're using, and maybe make some suggestions as to what could be changed. You can reduce or eliminate pesticides in your home for pollinators and your own health. Even at home when you're, you know, spraying your little can of insects, um, you know, pop or whatever else. Um, to get rid of the, the mosquitoes, that itself is a problem because that kills a lot of bees as well. Um, you can plant native plants or generally provide habitat. You don't have to have a massive pollinator garden. You can have a little corner in your, your backyard. You can have a little strip of plants. You can just have a little area that you leave alone and that will do wonders for, for native pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, so habitat providing, cutting your grass less frequently, leave the leaves. Find a corner in your yard and put down the leaves and leave them. Um, you can keep the stingless bees. You can also record your species. And I'm going to do a very quick thing on iNaturalist in a sec. And um, you can provide food plants for caterpillars. That's also very important. So what is iNaturalist? And this is something that I think is very good for school kids. Um, it has massive potential. There are lots of tutorials online on how to use it, what to do. It's a platform for citizen science. If you don't already know it, it's an app and a website. Um, it started out as a joint initiative between the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. It is now, I think, an independent NGO. Anybody can join, anybody can participate, and you can create your own project. So you can create your own school project on there. You can have kids register. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. It has a lot of potential. The idea is that you upload pictures or sounds of organisms. So you can, if you hear a bird call or frog, um, you can upload that as well, and people help you identify what they are. A uh, certain number of observations are needed for it to become um, sort of research grade is what they call it, and and be verified. Now, it's it's obviously not a perfect a perfect tool, especially for something that is as as tiny as these these different bees that you can hardly tell apart. But it will give you a general idea, and it helps us as well. So you can create projects on there to collect your own data. Um, you can also follow experts to see who they're identifying and as what, so you get some more information. And you can discuss findings and learn about nature by yourself or doing it with others. So it's a really, really useful tool. And I strongly encourage any and everybody to download it. And um, why should you do it? To learn more about nature and plants, animals, fungi, anything that interests you. To contribute to the knowledge of organisms in your country and to launch your own projects that support your work or your personal interests. So you can do all of that stuff. And if, again, if anybody needs any help with that, um, let me know. 
we have set up on there several projects. So we have a project that's called Pollinators and Pests of Trinidad and Tobago. The reason we've lumped those two together is because sometimes the line is difficult to draw. For instance, many farmers will consider caterpillar a pest, but it turns into a butterfly, which is pollinator. So this will help us monitor what species are there and also sort of trends over time. Where are people seeing certain pollinators or certain pests? We have set up one of these for every single Caribbean island. So if you're looking for your own island, all you have to do is look for pollinators and pests of, and then your island. Um, it's also been translated for the French islands, the Dutch islands, and the Spanish islands. And there's a collection project called Pollinators and Pests of the Caribbean, which pulls all the data from all of these, these projects together. Um, you join iNaturalist, you join the project, and you upload your photos and tag the project in it, and then your information will go towards the data that is exists. Now, anybody can go and download all of the information. If you want to use it for something, if you want to use it for a class project, for instance, you can go on our page, you can download the data, you get an Excel sheet with all of the observations. And it's something that you can use as a class exercise with looking at the different areas or looking at the different things. So what is the most prevalent one? It's also a good tool and way of teaching things about Excel and, and using data and so on for a little bit higher up in school. So I strongly recommend that. Um, the bigger picture, what do we need? Pollinator surveys everywhere. We need to know what we have. Um, research on the effects of climate change in local species and in neotropics. Um, we need the establishment of pollination networks. So we need to know who pollinates what. We need to identify vulnerable species. Biophysical accounting would be very useful, um, meaning where you sort of very similar in a, in a way that you would record your money. You would record the type of a number of species and the individuals within each for a certain area and do that on a regular basis so you get an idea of population trends. Um, that would feed into something like natural capital counting and then policy development. So those are those are some of the things. The Best Net TT project is sadly wrapping up in June, um, but we've been focusing on improving pollinator and pollination conservation and management. It is run by the Environmental Policy and Planning Division of the Ministry of Planning and Development in conjunction with UNDP. Um, which is the United Nations Development Program. And um, all of our resources are available via website and social media channels. We have a ton of educational materials um, and you can find us on, on these various areas. So I think the key message that I want everybody to take home is to know your insects. And um, yeah, thank you very much for, for rambling on about pollinators yet one more time. So let me know if you have any questions. All right, Stacy. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. This was really informative. And I don't know, you probably were prepared for having children today, but we know that the best presenters are able to present in such a way that children could understand. And you did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll be thinking, okay, I'll ask this. And then you come up with the information. I was going to ask about climate change. And then, you know, you mentioned climate change. I re are really, really grateful for not just what you presented, but the manner in which you did so. Really friendly to the eyes, to the ears. Um, I do want to say, you know, I know I, I don't represent all of Trinidad and Tobago, but just for what you have presented, you have solidified my whole idea about the value of this little nation. Um, you know, I, I just am overwhelmed with pride when I hear these kinds of things because it really talks to not just, we hear a lot of negative. You know, who knew that we were investing in this kind of research, you know, that this is happening in Trinidad, that we are aware and we are doing something about it. And so for the part that you are playing in that, we say thank you. For what you did today, we say thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Lena at this time. Uh, feel free to unmute or you can put your questions on the chat. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> so, Lena, what about uh, fruit flies and house flies? Because, you know, I mean, like, really, <laughs> they, get no, they get no respect. 
Yeah, they might have minor roles to play. That's the thing. We don't know. I mean, I have seen house flies on flowers, eh? so there's a good chance <laughs> that they do something, and we don't know uh, for sure. Um, but the thing is, you know, everything plays its role in the environment, even if it is that they are not part of um, the pollination crew. Mm -hmm. uh, they are certainly food for other organisms um, and they control population sizes of yet others. So they all have an important role to play. So, you know, even the ones that, that people don't like or yeah, people yeah. may not like, mosquitoes and all have some. In fact, mosquitoes might have a, a role to play in the production of cocoa. So mm -hmm. they might be cocoa pollinators. So, you know. <laughs> wow. I, I have a question. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned bats. Do they function at night only or throughout the 24 hour period yeah so so bats and moths are sort of the night shift um bats tend to go for very generally tend to go for very large flowers they tend to be white in color so different types of flower color can sort of indicate what what pollinates it once it's white and large it's and flowers in the evening then it's definitely a bat um many so anything that is purple, yellow, sometimes also white, that tends to be something that bees like, hummingbirds and so on, they go for red flowers. Uh, bees you'd hardly see on red flowers because they don't, um, their vision doesn't really pick that up as well. Uh, so you have different different colors of flower, but the bats certainly, uh, I'm, there may be some diurnal bat species, I'm not sure, but we don't, I don't think we have any here, but the bats are certainly around at night during the pollination. So they're, they're, Different types of bats have different rules. So some feed on insects and they can eat hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes a night each. Some uh, distribute fruit seeds. Uh, so they have a very ro important role in that. And then you have the pollination. Actually, mangoes um, are fairly well pollinated by bats as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I do have um, quite a few questions from the children in my class. Sure. Um, but, but I'll ask two and then give somebody else an opportunity and let's see how it goes time wise mm -hmm. so the first one are caterpillars pollinators and number two what's the difference between wasps and bees okay so caterpillars well first of all caterpillars turn into butterflies which are definitely pollinators caterpillars could theoretically be i've seen caterpillars up inside of flowers doing all sorts of things but the thing with caterpillars and ants is that because they don't have wings um, it's less likely that they'll be able to get to another flower on time to provide the effective service for that. Mm. Um, but they certainly, definitely, once they turn to butterflies and they get their wings, they fly about and they pollinate things. Uh, so that's that. And the difference between bees and wasps. So bees are basically vegetarian wasps. Um, they evolve from wasps, but they have developed a preference for eating, um, well, pollen and nectar and so on. Whereas wasps um, mostly feed on other animals. Mm -hmm. And the wasps are therefore excellent pest control agents because they go and pick up all the things that you don't want in your yard. Uh, but the bees are basically a type of wasp. As a follow-up, um, could you tell us some more about the stingless bees? You mentioned it several times. And not just you know the biology of it, but are we making a concerted, intentional effort to create that industry to improve? Yeah, it? so that is that's the thing. So it's been something that sort of anecdotally has been, uh, you know, a cultural thing, and people have been keeping it in their backyards and so on. Um, what what we've been trying to encourage, and I want to build on as a follow up project, is um, sort of developing that value chain for stingless bee products, um, because. For instance, a, a teaspoon of stingless bee honey can get sold for as much as maybe 10 US dollars. That's yeah. a teaspoon, that's five ml, because people are using it as eye drops for, uh, for medicinal purposes. Now, those bees produce a whole lot less honey than the apis bees, but it's a very popular practice in Central and South America, and to the point where they have so many hives that you sell them, they, you see them selling it by the roadside. So it is possible. Um, the problem is that remember I mentioned that they can't relocate hives and a lot of time with the forest fires, for instance, or mm -hmm. with logging, uh, the hives are destroyed and their population numbers have been declining. Uh, so we've been trying to push that a little bit more to get more people involved in it, get more people interested in it. Because the thing is, 
they don't sting. They fly a very short distance from your house. So you can keep them, for instance, inside of your house and face the entrance out through a breeze block or something like that. Mm. Um, so they go outside, they forage, they come back inside um, and that sort of thing. So they are, they are much easier to keep. They require much less space. You don't need any specialty equipment, bee suits or anything like that. Um, so it's maybe also a bit of a different type of um, target audience than a traditional beekeeper. Mm -hmm. because it's a little bit of a, it's more many, many people keep them sort of as pets and um there's one person in Trinidad in particular who i know has a whole bunch of hives and he's been um also keeping them so that the the wild bee uh, population can sort of repopulate so once they go out on their mating flights and so on you know he's hoping that they'll establish themselves more in the area as well so there's a lot of that kind of setup that we're hoping uh, we can work with people with to to get more of that going um those bees are native they're excellent pollinators the honey that they produce is of a, of a great quality um we just really trying to also raise awareness on on that as well so i'm assuming the honey composition is different yes and the... not yeah not just different to to honeybee honey so the apis honey but also different between each other because they're all different species so we have about nine or ten species um what most of those are fine to consume there is a particular genus the lestri milita their honey is poisonous mm -hmm. but it is only because they don't collect their own pollen and so on what they do is they raid the hives of other stingless bees <laughs> and as a consequence their honey is poisonous because of what the processing and what they're adding to it and so on okay. um but but all of these these um species have a different sort of a chemical profile between the different ones so that's another thing that we want to do and that needs to be done is the honey testing in terms of the composition in terms of what pesticides they might pick up along the way um if there's any diseases that are being carried that are being um wow. you know that they might be affected by that sort of thing so that's that's another area that that should be looked into yeah okay um, we are seeing on the chat here a lot of commendation uh, for the presentation. And so we have um, Reagan Walker and Dr. Calendar, I think I saw, Calendar yeah. Carter. And I want to believe this may be somebody who is familiar with you and, and involved in your work, Ian Cockburn, mm -hmm. um, talking about the stingless bees and so. So um, good communication there. Um, just a couple questions again from the class. What will happen in a world where there are no insects? Mm. And oh. what happens to the bees when they sting you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what happens in a world where there are no insects? Uh, I don't think much else will continue to exist for a number of reasons. <laughs> um, I mean, not just the, poll the pollination bit aside. Insects form a very important part of the food chain uh, and a lot of things feed on insects. And once they are removed, um, you will have a lot of animal species disappearing that are, that are sort of built on top of that. So that's the, that's the main thing, the food, the role in there. And there are other things that insects do. They do lots of things. So they are involved in pollination, but they're also involved in um tilling the soil and degrading um materials and recycling materials and that kind of thing so they have major roles to play in all parts of the ecosystem you have insects that uh live in water you have insects that live on land you have insects that fly even you, you have all kinds of roles in all different ways so if they disappear we are in a lot of trouble i don't think that we will exist beyond that mm. and what was the other thing oh the um what happens to bees if they sting um well, unfortunately, for the most part, I think the answer is they die because the stinger is a modified ovipositor, which is also why only female bees, bees can sting because males, male bees don't have that. So it is the piece of the bee through which um, eggs are laid onto wherever, into a hive or into a, a cavity or whatever it is. And it is modified in such a way that it becomes the stinger and the poison or whatever... Um, whatever deterrent can go through there. So um, most of the time what happens when it stings is get lodged in the in whatever it stings and it gets pulled out. So part of the abdomen gets ripped off and that's why they end up dying. Yeah. 
Um, Dr. Mori, I'm not sure about our time. Um, yeah, we are, we are good. Maybe a couple of more comments and questions. 1051, yeah. I don't, anybody else on the, oh, there's a question here on the chat. Um, could you address the issue of the transferability of disease between Apis, this is not my thing. I don't know if Apis you can- Apis Yeah, probably Apis Millifera, yes. maybe yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and stingless bees, yeah. Yes. And stingless bees? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that is, again, that is an area that I think even internationally, there isn't that much work on, but it's a major risk. The issue is that not just not just stingless bees, any bees really. The issue is that once you have something that visits a flower, um, it can, you know, similarly how disease passes between humans when people touch surfaces, it's deposited and somebody else picks it up. So there's a very good chance that um, a lot of diseases, if their physiology is vaguely, vaguely similar, can be transmitted via the flowers to others and then infect the rest of the hive and so on. Um, that is something we desperately need more information on. First of all, in terms of disease profiles for, for pollinators in general, what is even out there? What do we have to deal with in this country or in the Caribbean in general? And um, what, what can we do about it? So that's that's certainly a big a big issue. And it is a big risk. Um, the problem is we just don't have a lot of data on it. That's one of the areas that I, I'm sort of targeting in my mind for any kind of follow-up activities. Um, you mentioned that some honeys are poisonous. And I'm thinking yeah. if people are producing honey and just putting it by the road, roadside, is there some kind of quality control or some method to uh -huh. well, protect okay. the public? The short answer is no, there's no quality control. <laughs> but that's, um, that being said, uh, people that keep stingless bees know which species not to keep. And I am not even sure that you can keep that species in a box and get honey from them in the first place because they are very... Uh, so their nest entrance is a, a big tube. It looks like a, 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 a trombone or trumpet or something like that. It's, it's a, it has a very distinctive shape and it's very easy to recognize. So anybody that keeps stingless bees knows which species those are most of the time, but it's not something that people um, that people come across or regularly sell. Um, I, it's again, different species produce different quantities as well. So what people in Trinidad, for instance, would sell most of the time for food consumption would be the melipona honey. Um, they produce some of the most. And the one that is used for eye drops, I think is mostly the Frisio melita. So they have very different tastes and, and profiles and so on. And um, while there is, and that's again, that's part of what needs to be done. Quality control, standards, um, you know, how should you do things? And this is sort of where we, where we kind of started. We started at trying to encourage people to keep the bees. How can you keep the bees? How do you recognize the different species? And um, one of the things that we're doing through this project is providing guidelines for stingless beekeeping um, and a component about the biology and, um, and that sort of thing so that people have a better way of doing that. So we have these guidelines to start with. The intention was to develop a standard. Um, we didn't quite reach that far, just again, by virtue of not having the data and having to go out and get it in the first place. But that is the point where we're going to be taking off from, yeah, after I'm finished begging for more funding for these kinds of things. Okay. So I think we probably um, could end about this time because uh, I have more questions. I'm pretty sure, Stacy, your kids have more questions and others comments and questions, but... We'll probably um, need to uh, get uh, stopped here. And I am definitely interested in maybe having you come back uh, or someone that uh, could talk to us more about these stainless, stingless, stingless uh, bees, because it sounds very interesting. Um, yeah. And I guess, um, Lena, you could look at the chat there. Some questions there. Um, yeah, I'm not and sure maybe, yeah. you know, find some way to kind of, maybe when we yes. contact you. Um, yes. One of the things my students want to know, you don't have to answer is, um, are there other birds beside the hummingbirds that pollinate? Yeah, um, so some of the honey creepers hmm. and... Um, the well for Trinidad, I can't speak for other islands, I don't know. But um 
the honey creepers and the banana quits for sure. Okay. Um, the banana quits sometimes are a bit destructive, but but they do pollinate some stuff. So those are those are certainly some. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we are saying bidding adieu, and we are thankful for this session today. Um, and to my children, we are in different locations, but I just want you to know that you are commended for your questions. They are very deep and valuable questions that you were asking. And thank you guys for your comments. Thank you all for um, showing up today. And uh, I am hoping, um, Dr. Mori, you're gonna let me know of the sessions that you think my class and we will join again because I think it's very valuable for them. And we invite everyone else to make this a staple on Fridays um, and invite your friends to come. So, and Dr. Mori, thank you for what you are doing for um, everyone who benefits from these sessions. Whatever she said is our closing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Whatever Stacy said is the closing. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll um, hopefully have you all back next week, Friday. Take care. Have a great weekend. This was Thank very you. good. Very, very good. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.